In today's video, we are going to demonstrate how to find the correct powder charge for our precision load development process. During our test today, we are going to be testing for both powder and primer to see what is going to be the most forgiving load for us to use in the next step of this load development process. For the most part, I will be trying to follow the procedure that Eric Cortina has put forth. I'll be showing you all the data along the way, as well as a quick peek as what we were able to achieve for our extreme spread today. If you've watched Eric Cortina's video on common sense reloading, he talks about three things, combustion, harmonics, and internal ballistics. Today's video will be looking at the combustion part. So our goal of this testing is to find the powder charge that will hopefully give us the lowest extreme spread. That is step one. After we have that, we'll be moving on to the harmonics part and looking to test various cartridge overall lengths to improve our groups. But step one is combustion, and that's what we're working on today. So to be clear, today is all about getting that low extreme spread and validating that what we achieve is acceptable to move on to that next part of the testing. If you've watched some of the other videos where I've used Eric Cortina's method to tune a load I had already developed and had pretty good luck with, I skipped this part because I'd already previously accomplished it. Today, we are starting from scratch with a new combination. I don't want to get too distracted, but some guys have left some interesting comments on some of my previous videos. Most of the feedback has been extremely positive, and I certainly appreciate that feedback. If you're new to the channel, welcome. My overall philosophy on this channel has, and continues to be, in God we trust, all others bring data. My goal is to provide you the data and show these processes and how they affect performance. I am by no means trying to replace any of Eric's content. If anything, I hope to add some data and show how I work through this process, at least my interpretation of it. It's clear a lot of you guys are watching his channel, as am I, and there's lots of great content over there. I'm supporting him over on Patreon, and if you would like more of his process, you may want to consider it as well. His lowest level at the moment is $3 per video. In case you didn't understand it, like I didn't at first, that's the max per month you will pay. If he puts out 10 videos in a month, it's still $3 for that month, at the lowest level. Regardless, there's extra content over there if you choose to support him. I'm just here to learn and hope everyone else is as well. To be clear, I am in no way trying to make you think I am anywhere close to Eric's level or anyone else that we may be discussing here on the channel. I read a lot of info from Glenn Zedeker, Brian Litz. I listen to interviews with Scott Satterley and Eric as well. And I'm trying to do my best to learn and put the information into my process and see what results I'm able to achieve with that information. My goal is learning and improving, and hopefully let you guys learn from some of my mistakes I've made along the way. If you want to learn as well, this is a great place to do it. 98% of the comments here are positive, and lots of us are really just trying to improve, not make everything as complicated as possible. For today's test, we're looking at primers and powder. Our last load we developed with 140 grain ELDM and H4350. I realize that might be a little hard to find right now, and I don't have an endless supply either, so we're going to be switching to Alliance for Loader 16, and we're, today we're going to be working with 143 grain ELDX. I have struggled in previous attempts to find an acceptable load for this guy, so I haven't used it much, even though I have a few hundred laying on the shelf. In fact, our first attempt in our first outing with these resulted in a 1.25 MOA group and a 1.253 MOA group, even though our extreme spread over those 10 rounds total was only 14 feet per second and the standard deviation of 4.7. Whatever your thoughts are, it's not a winner in my book. I'm not saying that you can run out and find these components we're using today, but it's what I have enough of to do a reasonable load workup and still have some left over. If you're trying to pick a powder that you can actually find, don't hesitate to look at the burn rate chart and see what else might be close. If I was trying to do a load development with list load and I couldn't find reloader 16, I think that IMR 4451, which I have actually been able to get some of lately, would be a good option. Maybe H100V, Maybe Stayball 6.5. I can't possibly know what's available to you, but if you can find an option that others are having success with, and you can find load data to get started, today's video is just demonstrating that process that you would go through. You are still responsible for your own load data. Now for Reloader 16, I found that Sierra actually had some data for their 142 grain Sierra Match Kings. They actually had the max out at 43.5 grains, and for their 150 grain Sierra Match King, they had the max out at 43.0 grains of Reloader 16. If we can assume those are reasonable max charges for a 143 grain projectile, we can take that max value of 43.0 grains and back it down in 0.2 grain steps. Eric's video, similar to Scott Satterley's, step backwards for 10 rounds, but I had 26 pieces of brass, divide that by two separate primers that we're working with today, so we're going to be testing with 13 samples for each primer. This is doing two things, starting low and working up for pressure, as well as looking for plateaus and velocity nodes along the way. 
It's a rare occasion that I have found my best performance at max anyway, so we're going to see what data we get starting at 40.6 grains, increasing in 0.2 grain increments all the way to the 43.0 grain max charge. If you already have seen my Problem Findings Jam video, this 143 grain ELDX gave me a little bit of trouble. The touch point, or where the projectile first touches the lands, was at a CBTO of 2.227 inches. However, using the jam method that Eric has described, using a 0.635 expander mandrel to set my neck tension, I actually measured a jam point with a CBTO of 2.255 inches. Though I know if I had increased neck tension, this would be even further. I was having issues with the projectiles actually getting stuck, and so there's no reason to push our limits here. So we're going to take a CBTO of 2.255 inches, and I'm only going to back it off 15 thousandths rather than Eric's recommended 20, simply because we are changing the neck tension. So for our combustion test today, we're going to be loading at a CBTO of 2.240 inches. Our brass is two times fired Lapor brass, annealed, full length size with no expanding device, and then my neck dimension is set with my 0.242 inch mandrel. The brass is trimmed back to 1.910 inches. Our two primers we're testing today are my trusty old CCI 41, as well as the Fed 205 Match AR. I like these two options mostly because they have a slightly harder primer cup, and this gives me fewer issues when using small rifle primer brass in my 6.5 Creedmoor. Which brings us to our test platform. Our test platform is a Ruger Precision Rifle with a 26 inch Bartland barrel, 1 and 7.5 inch twist, chambered in 6.5 Creedmoor. For our testing today, we're mostly concerned with our velocity and looking for plateaus, so let's take a look at what we've got. Starting off with our CCI 41, at 40.6 grains we started at 2792 feet per second, Creeping up and at 43 grains, we actually hit a velocity of 29.27 feet per second. As some of you will be aware, I actually started using Arbor Press to seat my projectiles. I'm going to overlay that data. You can see that bottom line is the starting pressure for each one of those rounds, and the top line is going to be the final seating force it took to completely seat the projectile. Our starting and finishing forces were both pretty consistent along the entire graph, so there's no real changes in velocity that we can explain with having an inconsistent neck tension. Overall, I think our velocity graph is pretty good, and there are a couple small nodes on there, but let's not jump to conclusions. We are doing two different primers today. Moving on to the Fed 205 Match AR chart, starting down at 40.6 grains, we actually started down at 2765 feet per second. Moving all the way up to 43 grains, we actually maxed out at 2909 feet per second. So we ended up slightly slower than the CCI 41. But speed isn't everything. Consistent velocity is what we're looking for. Now laying those starting and ending forces on the graph, you can see the same is true. Really didn't see any huge changes in seating force that would make us question the velocity numbers that we got anywhere on that chart. Though you guys can certainly look at to your heart's content and let me know what you think in the comments section below. After seeing no real changes in the seating force that looked like a velocity response would have been affected, we can put on the same chart and we'll see which primer has the largest flat spot in the graph. If we're looking for the highest velocity, we would go with the CCI 41, somewhere around 42.7 grains. But the wider flat spot is with the Fed 205 Match AR and that middle charge of 42.6 grains. Seeing that our velocity at 42.4 grains being 2877 and going up to 42.8 grains, we can see we only had an extreme spread of five over that area. Not a crazy flat spot, but certainly worth looking at at a reasonable velocity. And I think that's where we're going to pick to start to do our test. There are a lot of critics out there of this single sample type testing. However, this is extremely similar, if not exactly what Scott Satterley talks about when he was looking for flat spots in his velocity nodes. Regardless of how you feel, the proof is in the testing, and it'll be no different today. If you want to look at more examples, you can check out a video that I will link at the end. It's going to cover the 10-shot load development method I did a while back, and it covers three separate tests that I used this method for. Statistical significance, or how you feel aside, let's put some samples downrange and see how the test comes out. Now we're going a little bit off the reservation because this part is not something I'm aware of that Eric recommends. This is just something I want to do to verify my load was sound before we move to the next step. Whether you choose to do this is simply up to you. I used this particular load for my hunting load this year. It's not as dialed in as I wanted it to be, but it was good enough to hit the woods at the distances that I needed it to be effective for. So I loaded the same brass at 42.6 grains of loader 16 at two different cartridge overall lengths. The one that we tested today and one that was shorter than our test values because I needed them to run in my magazine. The first was a cartridge overall length of 2.888, same CBTO of 2.240 inches, and the other at a cartridge overall length of 2.820 inches, 
again, to be able to run in my PMAG. I chronographed both these loads before I hit the woods to see what the velocity would look like. However, I did lose the picture of the group due to a corrupted memory card, but at least I have the velocity data. Now, our previous velocity measurement when we ran this test, again, was 2882. When we tested five rounds at an identical load, we had an average five shot velocity of 2888 feet per second, a standard deviation of 7.4 with an extreme spread of 19. Overall, not too shabby, but we'd really like to know what happens when we shorten that cartridge overall length. We actually tested 10 samples at our cartridge overall length of 2.820 inches. We achieved an average velocity of 2868 feet per second, so we basically lost 20 feet per second. However, standard deviation dropped to 5 and it had an extreme spread of 14. We lost 20 feet per second, our standard deviation dropped by 2.4, and our extreme spread dropped by 5. Even though we changed the cartridge over our length, it seems we didn't move out of our node too far. Now looking at the pressure signs of our velocity test, there are really no issues here to indicate there's high pressure at all, no ejector marks or excessive primer cratering. We could possibly even increase this charge weight a little if we really wanted to. But at this point, I think we found a combination that we can start tuning with to see what kind of groups we can get this down to. Now, our next part here is absolutely what Eric said not to do. I am violating his rules, but I know I'm going to get questions in the comments below. For the two velocity strings, Eric simply recommends getting the velocity data and not looking at the groups. Make your decision based on the velocity data, not the group data. The cartridge overall length is going to tune the groups. But overall, our CCI-41 had a total group size of 2.142 MOA, while the 205 Match ARs had a total group size of 1.225 MOA. Go figure. Anyway, our next step, as soon as I can get these loaded again, is three shot groups, changing cartridge overall length along the way to see if we can find and if we can get consistent small groups. With any luck here, we may have another load worth shooting, but only time will tell. If you're interested in more videos about this process, check out this playlist. If you want to complain about the statistical significance of this load development style, you can check out this video here where we look at three different times we've used the same method and the results that we were able to achieve then. Like, subscribe, and all that fun YouTube stuff. I hope to see you come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.